to Jen and Stephen who will be presenting the webinar to you today um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to answer any questions. Um, so Jen, over to you. Good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us all, uh, joining us today. We're really excited to talk to you about this topic today. It's really close to both our hearts. Um, so we'll just introduce ourselves first and then um, dive into the topic. Um, so my name's Jen Tinsley. I am the Head of Design here at Jupiter Play. I studied landscape architecture at the University of Sheffield and I came into the play industry after a couple of years in young landscape practice and been in about 12 years now so um yeah quite a long time um so this topic first came to my attention after reading wilding by isabella tree and i would urge anyone with an interest in this topic to read it so the pioneering effects of the rewilding project at net farm have really sort of stayed with me and it's something i draw on again and again when i'm um, thinking about space design um currently stephen over to you uh, hi everyone, my name's uh, Stephen Sixsmith. Uh, I'm a landscape architect. Uh, I joined Jupiter Play uh, around six months now, um, working in landscape architecture 10 years before that. And I think moving over into something uh, more focused on play, I wanted to come and kind of do the things that we were talking about today, you know, delivering more sort of landscape led play spaces as opposed to kind of uh, play spaces with an emphasis on kit. So I think that's it. We probably yeah, I won't uh, reveal it all. We've got plenty to talk about on that topic now. So firstly, I'll do a bit of introduction to Jupiter Play, what we're all about um, for those who don't know. We're a family run business that our MD Michael set up in his front room over 24 years ago now. Um, we're independent, meaning we're not tied to a particular brand, although all seven of our suppliers also family run and align with our values. Um, our partners really do help to sort of elevate us and keep it as they're all leaders in their respective fields, whether that's um, continuing research on inclusion through inclusive play or how to put sustainable development um, at the forefront of company policy like Lapset. Um, it allows us to access and draw on all those different sources when it comes to play design. Um, we also do have a number of large scale, what I would describe as wilder um, play projects in our portfolio, such as the image seen here um, from Harwood's Inclusive Play at Watford. Um, working in collaboration on these kind of projects really does help us to learn how we can create more natural and sustainable play spaces for the future. So today we're really going to look into what rewilding is and start to ask our own questions about how it does relate to play. And firstly, I'm going to cover the kind of global rewilding movement so we can understand what this phrase actually means and how it starts to influence smaller scale design. That's really what we're going to try and dive into today. Um, and the type of rewilding that we could achieve in play spaces would very much be sort of a community scale rewilding um, where we allow for space for nature to take over um, and, and try and kickstart those natural processes again. So what is rewilding? Um, and on to the next start, slide, we're going to start just here. I thought I'd start with a really strong, beautiful image here, um, which is called Island of Nature. And um, this is from the Rewilding Europe photo competition, which shows really an oasis of peace and calm within a cultured landscape. And I think this really perfectly illustrates nature's ability to recover in even the most kind of barren of landscape. And if it's given that opportunity, I think it illustrates that so well. So to restore stability to our planet, we must restore its biodiversity, the very thing that we've removed. It's the only way out of this crisis we've created, so we must rewild the, the world. This quote um, from Sir David Attenborough from the Wild Foundation, um, which is building on a global movement to protect and recover wild, uh, wilderness. And I think it perfectly sums up why rewilding is so essential. So what exactly is rewilding? Um, rewilding is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. Conservation has worked hard for decades to save wildlife and specific spe species, but it's time to move beyond those sort of ind that individual approach um, and patches of nature. Rewilding attempts to take a sort of big picture approach, aiming to restore the, the wild and natural processes that actually support wealth, uh, life and its all, all um, interconnectivity. We can only thrive if nature thrives. Um, this quote from it, it 
from rewilding britain i think captures just how essential it is to assure ensure that nature thrives if we and in particular our children um and the next generation want to thrive and yeah who doesn't want that really Rewilding can help reverse species extinction, it can tackle climate change and improve our overall health and well-being. Um, Rewilding Britain believes that nature is in fact our best ally um, in the fight against climate change. Rather than searching for the next big sort of technological fix, um, trees, peatlands, salt marshes and other ecosystems are already perfectly adapted to soak up carbon dioxide uh, and store it. We've already got all the answers there if we could just kind of look to nature. Um, and but as of 2021, new data has shown in the UK is actually one of the world's most nature depleted countries and in the bottom 10% globally and the last among the G7 group of nations. We're actually seeing that 15% of species in, in Britain are being threatened with extinction and only 2.5% of our land is covered by native woodland and biodiversity is declining faster um, than at any time in human history. And our sector is definitely helping to play a part in addressing this crisis and we can really look at how to do that today. I'm going to pass over to Stephen now. He's going to talk through the rewilding and policy making. Yeah, sure. I'll talk through this boring stuff as quick as possible but it's uh, it's useful and important because i think especially with working with clients sometimes people want to see what's the hard evidence that kind of justifies the sort of things that we want to deliver so if we go to the, start at the high level and then we'll go down into talking about uh, uk policy in a second and we'll start with the uh, un sustainable goals so the uh, 2030 agenda provided a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet for now and in the future and the way they wanted to deliver that was through 17 goals now of the 17 we think we can probably help uh, work with seven of them the most important one the topic of today's discussion talking about rewilding and enhancing biodiversity in play spaces would be point 15 but we could also work with the issues of uh, improving healthy lifestyles uh, quality education and promoting lifelong learning uh, gender equality and empowerment of women and girls uh, making cities and human settlements inclusive safe resilient and sustainable the urgency to tackle climate change where the two things kind of go hand in hand really and we'll we'll probably cover a lot of topics that um talk about that issue today tackling biodiversity loss which is um the point 15 that's on the screen and also promoting peaceful and inclusive societies uh, for sustainable development. So that's the UN high level stuff. How does that kind of affect UK legislation? And that's through the Environment Act 2021. So we lost the EU directives post Brexit. And this is our sort of going forwards are the new act that kind of informs what we're going to do in terms of tackling issues of air quality, um, issues with water, biodiversity and waste reduction. And there's a few things that uh, it, how the legislation is delivered, and that is through the biodiversity net gain, uh, local nature uh, recovery strategies, trees and woodland strategies, uh, and also the environmental uh, improvement plan. Um, if we just go on to the next slide. So how can uh, play provision help uh, and support policy and uh, those strategies? So I've kind of already just mentioned them, but they've, we've got them briefly uh, summarized on the next slide. So biodiversity net gain, I'm sure by now everybody's heard of it 10 times over. It's kind of the a really sort of prevalent topic at the minute as it's coming in in November 2023. And uh, most planning applications will need to show that they've got a 10% a improvement in biodiversity. Um, and that's really important. It sounds really positive. It's something that we can definitely contribute to. Play spaces in particular, as well as in terms of just landscape and open spaces, we can really diversify planting. We can improve uh, trees, shrubs, hedgerows, um, even improving grasslands to species rich grasslands and meadows, whilst they might not score highly in terms of, um, because uh, they might not score highly in terms of basically there's a trade off between um, play spaces and um, sort of restoring natural habitats. But we're aware that we can kind of make slight improvements that really make a big difference on the local level. Um, there's also the uh, local nature. Um, recovery strategies which are wider strategies at the sort of county level and how we'd probably tie in best with these is uh, through the trees and woodland strategies so this should be um, part of the local nature um, recovery strategies and it could also be uh, adopted as supplementary um, planning documents 
and that that's really important for us because we can we can deliver trees in play spaces but it's not just trees within that strategy it should include uh, trees hedgerows orchards and woodlands and these will be on private land as well as land owned uh, or managed by local authorities and other public bodies so most mature trees that we see in parks and public spaces now were planted by the victorians and we're we're kind of in that process of almost chopping them down now as they're getting too big or or clashing with other things so we really need to be uh, thinking about planting that next um generation of trees that kind of serve the country for the next 100 years so again the way play areas can benefit from that is that something that we hear a lot is uh, the issue of sort of the right tree in the right place so we may not be able to plant larger tree species like oaks in urban settings or street trees but it could be a perfect place to um, plant uh, larger trees in, in play areas and they're, they're kind of really beneficial for imaginative play natural play as well as just enhancing the the appearance of uh, play spaces there's also the environmental improvement plan which started out as the um 2018 25 year environmental plan but as part of the environment act the initiative now is to update that every five years that's been updated uh, this year and they've set out 10 goals to uh, achieve those targets and we think that there's an opportunity for play areas to kind of help tackle five of those those points so the first one would be um, thriving plants and wildlife so we could provide diverse planting and provide nectar sources and uh, high binocular for invertebrates in play spaces again we, we spoke to a couple of uh, ecologists recently and we we're, were really having a good discussion about that trade-off between kind of trying to deliver habitat space that um sort of uh, works well with play because obviously we're talking about play we want kids to be running around making noise which doesn't always work in terms of um habitat space but we can diversify planting and improve improve on sort of amenity grass and, and things like wet paw and harder surfaces the other point is clean air and we can we've got a good case study on that later we've also got um using uh, resources from nature more sustainably which again we've got a point a bit later on in the presentation um talking about uh, timber sourcing uh, and again you know thinking about the materials that we use for kit as well as um what we do with the with the landscape is really important we've also got uh, within those uh, list of goals mitigating and adapting to climate change so how can we integrate uh, nature-based solutions uh, within the play spaces? And number 10, which we think um, we definitely can do, and uh, I think um, our, our most landscape projects um, do all of the above, and especially this one, enhancing beauty, heritage, and engagement within the natural environment. So there's a couple of subcategories within that where they've talked about the importance that everyone should live within 15 minutes of um, green or blue space, which again, play spaces can really um, contribute to this also enhancing nature and well-being and uh, connecting children with nature and again we've got some really good examples of this uh, later on too and finally improving engagement with natural processes and climate change through education so again if we want to tackle the issue of climate change we've got to think about how we can engage generations to uh, restore their connection with nature and understand the importance of it and again plays another great way that we can do that um that uh the final thing I just wanted to mention on the um, environmental improvement plan was that they talked about the importance of hedgerows. So hedgerows are the largest uh, UK habitat uh, in the UK now. And again, hedgerows is a really easy win in play spaces in terms of thinking about boundary treatments. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So, and, and then the next one, sorry. And then I'll pass you over to you, Jen, I'll sort of rattle through the policy as best as possible without uh, trying to keep, make it too dry. Are you on mute, Jen? Sorry. It's okay. No, 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 no I'll, I'm, I'm glad. I thought, was gonna be, I thought it was going to be me doing that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, as I was saying, well, nobody could hear. Um, I'm going to zoom back out a bit again and um, talk about rewilding and culture. Um, so to start with, um, for the first time ever, um, the RHS 
Chelsea Flower Show, visitors were able to experience the amazing rewilding impact that eco-engineers such as beavers can have on the loss of um, nature in Britain and boosting the beauty and biodiversity of our landscapes. So the global movement really has kind of started to move forward into, into popular culture, as we can see here. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, um, with this garden. Um, so unusually for the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, in order to present as authentic a picture as possible, native grasses are shown as one would see them in the wild with their previous year's growth on them and their pre-season seed head remnants left on, together with brown former season's dead foliage. Um, I'm actually going to revisit this idea later in the presentation about how we can start to sort of shift the perception around what is considered beautiful in our design landscapes and move away from that really sort of pristine aesthetic that um, is very appealing to people. Um, so the garden included lots of different features, um, meadow, an old timber walkway, um, native wildflowers and plants with a real focus on native species as well. I think it really helped to kind of um, shine a light on rewilding and um, the importance of it. So we are really aware at Jupiter that rewilding has become a, a real kind of buzzword within the industry. Um, and we do really want to make sure we're being really, really considered about how we use that term when it comes to play. Um, I think people are, are, are now a lot more aware of the damage that some industries can do um, to our environment. And so greenwashing can often be used to persuade customers to use a product or a service um, and that by doing that, they will be helping the environment. And this can be really misleading um, as things sort of may seem environmentally friendly, but have a hidden cost in the environment that we're not aware of. Um, and this practice of greenwashing isn't new, but it has become a lot more common and harder to recognise. And we really want to strive to avoid this sort of tokenistic and damaging approach within the play, uh, play industry, obviously uh, um, at a wide scale as well. But I think it's very easy to throw in some of these these sort of token words. Uh, is it eco? Is it, um, you know, environmentally friendly? But how are we actually really tangibly um, attempting, even at a very small scale, to, to rewild? So in the next section, I'm going to talk a bit more about the value of natural play and why this is really important for children. Um, and starting off here with a with a really important quote for a new generation nature is more of an abstraction than a reality increasingly nature is something to watch to consume to wear and ignore um so this is a really worrying observation and we need to create more opportunities for children and communities to engage with nature um if we want children to flourish, they have to be truly empowered and let them let us allow them to love the earth before we ask them to save it. And I think we really believe that creating a love of the environment begins with enjoying nature. Um, and here we've got a really nice grid um, of photos of our team and their kids during lockdown, actually, um, which is fe feeling I kind of at the forefront of our minds at the moment, obviously, with being three years ago um, just now. Um, and I know personally, like lockdown really became a time for my kids to reconnect with nature on a on a very like micro level and um, whether that was forgotten corners of the park or in our garden um and it was definitely an important lesson for me as a parent about how little structured activities that kids actually need to thrive and be able to play for hours and i witnessed firsthand on a daily basis the power of us going outside and what a game changer that can be simply in terms of mood and stopping that kind of cabin fever feeling um so yeah that's that's really important to remember and leading on from this, um, these statistics are quite interesting from our sector um, on the profile of green uh, green spaces, parks and play areas during the pandemic. Um, and the statistics here, such as 53% of people questioned, say they appreciate local parks and nearby countryside more since, um, since COVID. And al almost a third of people say they were visiting local green space more often since lockdown. And over half felt they were more aware of the importance of such green spaces to mental health and well-being. So I think people really lived that experience and really understood how valuable um, local green spaces have become. 
and for me this really kind of sums it up no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced obviously going towards David Attenborough again but he's very very wise as we all know um but it helps to reiterate that if we want to tackle climate change effectively in the future we've got to help to foster a love of nature in children through their experience of it um so there's an increasing amount of research now to show that there are huge benefits, as I've just mentioned, um, to be gained from spending time in high quality green spaces and engaging with the natural environment. And the charity Mind lists a multitude of wellbeing benefits um, from time spent in nature. Um, again, I think it's something we're intrinsically aware of, but um, the this, this statistics and the evidence is there now to prove it. It can improve physical health, help you to be more active, um, reduce feelings of stress and anger and, and help to improve your mood, amongst many other things as well. And I really, really love this from the, the Wild Network about rewilding childhood. Um, and the evidence is really clear that a rewilded childhood can um, lead to many sort of direct and indirect benefits um, to help them thrive in our modern environment. Um, it can really help to develop um, flexibility, solving unpredictable challenges, um, help to ch make children more emotionally robust and calmer, help them to encourage them to judge risk, um, which is something we'll touch upon throughout, um, obviously happier and physically healthier, um, and more able to communicate and problem solve. And all of these benefits can be reached through spending more time in nature. So it seems like such an easy win, um, win to us for children. And actually, green space isn't just a nice to have, it's a need to have. Um, aside from being beautiful to look at, it plays an important part, as Stephen's already touched on through all these policies, in absorbing pollution, minimising climate change, noise pollution, the impact of flooding, the list goes on. And actually, in reality, all of these benefits are rarely considered when thinking about a play space in isolation, um, particularly um, in the way um, tenders are evaluated and similar um, things like ease of maintenance and play value are usually seen as the most important thing rather than what the play space is giving back to the wider community as a whole. Um, and they can give back so much more than simply a low maintenance swing or a slide if we really kind of make those spaces work as hard as possible. Um, so next we're going to uh, go through a section and I'm going to pass back over to Stephen now about how we can begin to rewild play at community level as designers cheers jim so yeah as jim mentions what can we do as designers so firstly planting it's an easy win it seems obvious for landscape architects um but obviously we can really improve the uh, appearance of uh, play areas through planting but obviously all the other benefits that planting does too so it increases biodiversity and pollination opportunities. It encourages wildlife, absorbs CO2, uh, improves soil quality, improves drainage, uh, increases sensory stimulation, and uh, you know enhances the uh, aesthetics. But you know, for, it's kind of preaching to the converted if we if we talk about planting in play areas. It's the issue with planting is uh, maintenance, and that's the biggest issue that we've got to try and tackle. Um, but I think. The position we're in now where we're launching all sorts of new policy and guidance as to how we can show we're, we're improving developments for the better i think this is something that has to come hand in hand and the decision makers and clients who have the money need to set aside costs to to make sure that we can deliver these spaces but also we can um maintain them as well and things like meadows hedgerows and grasslands can store high amounts of carbon in the soil trees can absorb carbon and then obviously flowering plants can provide nectar sources and food sources for a variety of species um, and also on top of that planting can be incorporated into the play experience so not just in terms of improving the aesthetics we can actually make play features out of um out of the structures which we can show on some of these case studies coming up now so um, if we start with this case study, it's um, Arxay Activity Park in Watford. It was done by Southern Green Landscape Architects up in the northeast, and it used uh, Jupiter Play uh, units as well. And uh, this is a really good example of a play space that uses uh, planting for multiple purposes. So we're talking about improving the appearance, uh, defining edges and the spaces. Uh, it also uses sort of nature-based solutions. Uh, you can see the suds ponds, and you can also see the green roof uh, in the bottom left corner as well. And that 
use of planting to kind of define edges and frame spaces really just looks infinitely better than uh, a, a fence or uh, using a walls or anything like that but you can see it looks good but it's also doing a multiple uh, other functions in the background as well which is um, fantastic um, this is a great scheme a lot of people use it as case studies where I was working last year we had a community group who wanted to deliver a skate park and they used this as a, a great example of delivering something like a skate park which has got a lot of hard space but then also is kind of providing uh, contributions for the better through the SUD system so that the biggest argument that people might come across is that you know if we're delivering a lot of concrete or um, asphalt what about the permeability but if you you can do it do it well with a with a good sort of landscape scheme uh, integrated um, and then the next example is a really good example of uh, messy play so this was done by um, erect architecture working with jupiter and another play company and this is just a fantastic example of a, a messy play area i know jen's going to talk about the sort of benefits of mess later um but you can see that the, the scheme uh, integrates suds and it also integrates um habitat um features with high binoculars which we will show in a couple of other photos in a second but again it just looks fantastic you can see it's a designed landscape but it's got a real natural feel to it and in terms of if you're a kid and you see that that just looks wild and really fun it really sort of sparks the imagination it's it's much better than just an amenity grass area with that uh, balance beam unit placed um so yeah it really it really can just transform transform a play space it um that's a personal favorite of mine uh the next case study that we've got is the uh, Level and Brighton. So that's an LUC design scheme. Um, and I believe it's uh, Jupiter units on, on this scheme as well. And uh, this design really focused on inclusion. And it's a fantastic example of how planting can really become part of the play experience. So on this slide, we're showing the sensory planting with the uh, lavender and the ornamental grasses, which provide nectar sources and sort of that sensory interest. But on the next slide, we've got um the willow tunnel which i mean the willow tunnels have been around for ages they're such a simple simple um feature that can really transform a play space i know if um, anyone's been to edinburgh botanical gardens they've got some great uh, willow tunnels that kind of intersect and weave and almost you they're so long you sort of stand at one point and you end up in another and you kind of feel like you've you've gone on a journey uh, with it they're just hours of fun um but as, as well as that it's kind of that sensory experience as well. So that dappled shade, providing shelter, providing a quiet space. It, it really enhances the the play area and children engage it then with the um, with uh, plants and nature. And this goes back to this argument that if we're trying to all of a sudden now rally people to try and save the planet, we really need to engage kids with natural processes and get them to really see the benefits. If they develop that bond with nature, there's a better chance of them looking after it in the future. So the uh, the next example is uh, Holton Fields in Rugby, and this was working in partnership with Urban and Civic uh, BMD Landscape Architects, and uh, we were again involved with supplying some of the uh, the play units. But you can see here the landscape's really integrated um, with the play space using the topography integration of trees and fell materials on site. So trying um with the with the logs as well um if you switch on to the next two slides as well you can see the use of um meadow which is fantastic in terms of bng what we were speaking about previously and also patches of ornamental sensory planting that provide nectar sources uh, and all and sort of textural interest so again it looks great and it's doing doing all sorts of multiple functions in the background which is i think that's something that when i was writing the notes for this presentation kind of kept going back to that it looks good and it's doing all the other stuff in the background it's kind of and i think the biggest thing after this once we present everything people will say money maintenance clients buy-in how do we do that and i think we really need to drive home that issue with the you know policy that's sort of driving the, these factors but then also say that it's not just a nice to have these also have uh, multiple benefits not just for the appearance of the the play space um the next example is uh, again it's nothing to do with us we just wanted to include it because we think it's fantastic um it's the sheffield green pollution barrier and this was carried out by the landscape department at sheffield uni with urban wilderness in leeds and um, so this was work of a phd student and this is a fantastic example of how we can kind of deal with issues of uh, quality of air. So this was at, uh, at a, a school in Sheffield 
Uh, the playground was adjacent to um, Shara Vale uh, and Junction Road. Really busy bit of Sheffield, if um, anybody knows it, in terms of vehicles. And it's such a simple idea. They've basically planted up the, the boundary using ivy and, and then herbaceous plants in as well along the edges. And it really, it, in terms of, again, it looks good and it's doing all the other stuff in the background. Um, it, it, yeah, it, and if, in terms of such a simple intervention, it really transforms a, a school playground from what would probably look like quite a, a just a very standard um, school play space into this green backdrop that kind of provides all sorts of opportunities for imaginative play. Um, I can imagine it's really transformed uh, the, the, the quality of that place tremendously. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's a case study that we haven't been directly involved in, but it's not necessarily today about sort of sales pitch of promoting Jupiter. It's more about giving you guys food for thought and ideas and um, kind of trying to just rally people around for this uh, this movement for the common good, I guess. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, which is encouraging wildlife, which kind of comes as part of the planting um, category, but in itself, it's kind of a, a, a category in its own right too. And again, it everything kind of overlaps with each other. So we're talking about um, biodiversity net gain. And again, biodiversity net gain, we want to diversify planting, we want to in incorporate nectar sources, because that's something that we can achieve really easily in play spaces. But in that terms of that habitat creation, we were speaking to ecologists about how we could potentially incorporate bird boxes or bat boxes in play spaces. And we were talking about the trade off with noise and disruption, and also the issue of bird and bat poo. Um, so really the what we've kind of come to is in sort of hibernacular for invertebrates is a really easy win for us and this is an example at holland park which is that same scheme that we showed previously when we were talking about the messy play and this shows how you can integrate uh, hibernacular features into simple interventions like the fencing um again you could you could kind of use the standard creature towers sort of located in uh, meadow we've probably seen loads of case studies of that it's it's a lot of this stuff that we're probably speaking about today is kind of knitting together a lot of ideas that we already know about but it's it's really important to to bang that drum and kind of remember this the simplicity of these really simple ideas can do can do a tremendous um, amount of benefit especially as the the importance now that kind of everybody needs to sort of chip in and, and do their bit at the local level um it's it's really important to remember the, the small things we can do can have a big difference um, and the next slide is education so again education came up a lot when we were talking about policy talking about trying to create that um, bond between uh, children and nature so that they um, might might sort of do a better job at, at than us at sort of looking after it um, if we go on to the next slide oh in fact Jen I've, I'm getting carried away we're doing a little dovetail on this one aren't we I'll let you speak about this one we are <laughs> Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, we, we, we've both got a, a case to do that I think we're both quite invested in, um, in terms of education. Um, and this is one that I really enjoy in the um, Nottingham where we're based. Um, and actually Nottingham Council pledged to increase um, bee friendly environments in all 20 city wards. Um, and that was really accelerated by the pandemic. Um, I'm sure we see this, saw this nationwide, but I saw it kind of on a really local level. Um, and public realm of operatives who would have otherwise been mowing grass um, ended up working elsewhere. And no herbicide spraying really allowed plants and wildlife to thrive in places that they wouldn't usually been able to do that. Um, and then we saw these signs um, popping up all over that helped educate that this was deliberate and it's it's a very small low cost intervention um, and as Steve was saying it's, it often is something really really simple but um, the signs would say excuse the weeds we're feeding the bees and they've popped up all over the city but just just helping to educate people that it's deliberate and it's not something to be fearful of um, it just it's just that shift in perception again I think is really 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 effective. I'll pass back over to you, Stephen. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and this one is uh, East Ors, oh, sorry, East Ordsall Lane in Salford. Um, so I came across this last year when I was looking for kind of good examples for um, kind of providing opportunities to uh, educate the public on sort of nature-based solutions. And we were working on a project that incorporated SUDS into a council estate, and we wanted to. Um, kind of uh, improve people's understandings of the benefits of suds 
and this is on i think this is a, a case study from syria um so um it's already sort of under the spotlight you guys might already be familiar with it but it's such a simple simple scheme it's just four trees in a permeable tree pot a tree pit in a side street in salford but they've got these markings that demonstrate where the water goes and the signage on the picture on the left that kind of describes the the um the cycle of the the suds um it's a really exciting educational resource um it's part it, the some of the stats on it it's um storm water has been slowed by over an hour obviously suds increase water uh, increase water quality and then trees in the street scene provide vertical interest and soften soften the streetscape but they also add um, biodiversity and assist in improving air quality um and it, it's so simple it really it's just paint on tarmac with some permeable tree pits and we could do that kind of thing within play spaces so easily um through the markings so yeah it's really simple but a really fantastic uh, case study thanks Stephen. now so i'm going to talk through in the next section um of how we can sort of continue to to do these sort of interventions is about working with existing landscape features um so some real benefits to working with the existing landscape um that may seem obvious, but obviously it's really thinking about enhancing that sense of place, um, encouraging that sort of connection with the local environment instead of kind of coming in and, and eradicating that for a, a sort of flat surface. So how can we kind of engage with that local environment, those local kind of native um, species and all the rest of it and naturally occurring elements, um, as well as reducing the carbon footprint of, um, of the design. So the first example I'm going to talk about a really nice um, example in, at Alkery World in Cambridge, working in collaboration um, with the landscape architect there. And um, this bespoke unit was actually designed to sit within these within these trees, so the children can um, climb up into them. Um, obviously, again, this kind of really gives that value to the bespoke design. It means we don't have to um, we don't have to. Um, chop down the trees we don't have to not I think the trees were actually planted as part of the scheme um and but they yeah we don't have to avoid them we can work around them we can work within them and as Stephen has touched on a few times it's like a double whammy in terms of it's it's aesthetically beautiful it's better for play value and also it's it's contributing um to the environment the next case is another really nice example which is Bookton House in Bradford um, and this was a really complicated site. Um, it was all in a fruit protection zone and with some really mature trees um, and all the foundations had to be hand dug. And we weren't able to use any machinery for the equipment. Um, and it also had to go through a really rigorous planning application, but it shows the value that if the client is willing to do that and willing to kind of go through those processes, the outcome is so much stronger um, in terms of play value. Um, so, yeah, we really believe that it's worth it to play play waves in and out throughout the trees. And obviously the trees become part of that play experience. It's not a separate experience. It's encouraging the play throughout nature. Um, it's really, really valuable. Um, the next one um, is a project that our presenter Rosie worked on with Bradley Murphy Design, which is a really beautiful design in Water Beach uh, development in Cambridge. And again, um, as the previous two, it had to be designed around a really dense network of established trees um, so that the play really felt truly integrated. And I think this image shows really nicely how well they have it has integrated within the environment. Um, and what was really nice as well was the um, the um, theme and the narrative the concept for the site um, was around the network of habitats that are already found in that development. So again, it's allowing that education, it's, it's encouraging children to discover those natural processes and understand the interconnected, uh, interconnected habitats that already exist there. Um, and finally, here is um, a really nice case study, which some of you might have seen already. Um, we use a lot, which is Simington Rec, because it's just such a such an amazing design to me. Um, about, again, about how can play can be designed to sit within existing landform um, rather than disrupt it. And it allows the natural character of that site to remain. It feels very much a part of the landscape. Um, and even those kind of... Um, 
messy bits the uh, uh, sort of te not technically messy bits but you know the kind of shrubs the the bits growing around the edge it's it's not had to be cut down it's all kind of part of the overall scheme and again it for me that's that's a much more inviting place to go and play in um because of it i'll hand back over to you now Stephen, for thoughts yeah sure so again we've talked, kind of talked about tackling climate change improving biodiversity and um in integrating uh, nature-based solutions into uh, place bases and i think suds is the another prevalent one at the minute it seems to be a lot of really good work um being done with suds especially in wales um and suds is another really easy way that we can integrate um into play proposals so when we're talking about uh, play spaces they can retire with the wider drainage of a development in a playful way uh, traditional play areas used to be covered in wet pour and sort of impermeable surfaces and maybe we need to be thinking about moving away from from those areas again with everything there's always a trade-off you do still need some hard standing areas to improve accessibility and inclusivity but there's you know there's different ways that we can achieve that and again like we were talking about the skate park if you've got areas of hard they can always be um their runoff can be directed into uh, sud systems so um the again it, it, they look great to do all sorts of um, benefits you know they can be low maintenance um so it's going to enhance uh, biodiversity help uh, manage the flow of the water mimics nature reduce the impact of the drainage network um if we move on to the next slide i think we've got some good case studies of play so start off this isn't a case study of ours and um, again not all these case studies that we're showing today are ours we just want to shine a light on good stuff and kind of give you guys food for thought and it's, it's you know it's important for us to um, promote good work generally. So this is um, Bridget Joyce Square by Robert Bray Associates. And I think they might have shared some really good videos in the last couple of weeks on LinkedIn um, about this space. And if you guys give it a Google or if you know the project, you'll know that some really good studs work um, in this uh, public realm. And then from our point of view, what's really interesting about it is they've incorporated that really simple play feature. And again, you know, when we're talking about integrating play, it doesn't have to be the most complex things it can be something as simple as a, a really small um, boardwalk that lets kids whiz past on the scooter or run through. Um, and the other important thing to remember with suds as well is that they're not always necessarily going to be wet, depending on the type of suds that we use. So we've got to kind of think about their multi-use to get as much um, benefit from them as possible. Um, and, and this is a really good uh, example of um, a sud scheme that's doing that. If we move on to the next slide, again, uh, the use of kind of like swales to marcate a play space. I think West Gorton in Manchester that was done by like BDP. Again, uh, <laughs> saying we weren't involved in these in the projects necessarily, but it's good to it's good to shine a light and uh, kind of uh, sort of give a nod to the people doing good stuff. Um, the you can see the play features in here. The topography kind of is um, is formed so that the runoff runs into to that swale. I don't know if you can see on that picture, but I noticed it says keep off in the swale. And that's not necessarily something that we would um, want to promote. Um, I think a board, a board like that should be explaining why it's there and um, not not discouraging people from playing in it, you know, but then that element of people understanding things. And if then they realize, OK, we understand why that's there for you may not necessarily want to vandalize it. You may not necessarily. But, the, I don't think there's too much harm in, in kids running around. I think it, it might be there just from a health and safety point of view for um, issues with water. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, there's a, a good example. Again, really simple. When we're talking about play, it doesn't always have to be kit. It can just be something as simple as a bank for kids to run up and down and run through. And this swale is a really good example of just a good sort of wet, muddy area. What Jen was saying before, I'm sure our kids would uh, kind of spend hours just splashing through the, the puddles and uh, running through the um the root of the of the suds um yeah it, it can be something as simple as that really um and again it, like, like i've already said it's really important to remember that the play isn't about sort of air dropping kit it can be uh used in the, the landscape as well if we move on to the next slide i think this might be the last slide on the suds but again use of rain gardens so again different types of suds you've got swales basins um rain gardens um, and this is a fantastic example of just like a, a really simple rain garden with a couple of um, stepping stones that run through it. And you can see in the background, there's a pretty rubbish, sterile play area in the background. But where are the kids playing? 
the playing in the rain garden because it's much more interesting in terms of its sensory interest kind of the tactile element of it but it's just fun for imaginative play and natural play which again themes and topics that have been being talked about for years but i think after covid people have really switched on to issues of improving better quality outdoor spaces and then obviously unfortunately as, as climate change gets far more serious and and uh, we're kind of over at that point now where we can't really pretend that it's not happening that we've got to really uh, think about how we can deliver multiple uh, spaces that have, we've got multiple benefits um and again we could say it's they're playing in a really simple area that doesn't have kit and again when it comes to play spaces it's really important that they're designed it's not just a case of delivering the the kind of kfc buzzword that again everybody's heard of that kit fence and carpet you've got to really think about how these spaces can benefit in terms of nature-based solutions but then also um provide really interesting engaging spaces for kids as well um and i, I think that is everything on suds Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I'm going to talk, we've touched on this a, a few times throughout um, the presentation already, but I'm going to talk here about um, how we can look at aesthetically embracing that messiness or perceived messiness a little bit more. Um, and if we are going to really embrace rewilding within the landscape, then we do need to examine these kind of contemporary design trends for cleanliness and um, how this can actually be quite detrimental um, for biodiversity. Um, so I love designs like this as much as everybody else is. It's it's beautiful design, um, but a lot of aspirational urban landscape play design um, features like this one in uh, Super Cool and in apologies if I've not said that right, uh, Copenhagen. They are beautiful, but they don't allow for any kind of messiness and permeability. Um, so it's really interesting to start thinking about how we can unpick that a little bit more because this is seen as a kind of quite an aspirational image. And again, on the next slide, um, we've got here like a typical urban design approach to a college play space. It offers a beautiful and pristine aesthetic, but it doesn't allow for any kind of natural um, untidiness. And again, it's like if, if children are growing up in these environments, they're not comfortable with any natural process, really, or any understanding of what the natural environment actually needs to be to survive. Um, so I think it's really interesting. Again, you see this kind of design a lot within an education setting. Um, and yeah, it's just it's food for thought. So um, how do we start to embrace the messiness in design generally and in particular play design? Um, I really encourage anybody to comment in the chat. How do they feel when they look at images like this? We would really like to hear from you um, and be honest, be as honest as you want, because, yeah, I, I struggle with this kind of um, conflict, really, um, when I'm designing as well, as much as I'm kind of super invested in, in, natu in natural play. So please do comment in the chat. How can we start to unpick our need for the pristine, clean landscape and shift our culture towards more of an unkempt aesthetic? but it's ultimately way better for our planet and for children playing as a whole. Um, and these, these images are from um, Harwoods um, in um, Watford, which I, I kind of mentioned right at the beginning. Um, and I believe in terms of play value, these landscapes are infinitely more rich and engaging, but there can almost be a fear around these, particularly from the general public, um, of, of anything too wild. People aren't looking after it. What's why is it not being cared for and all that that kind of uh, narrative around it so i think it's it's interesting how we can start to make these interventions to just shift that um i'm next i'm going to touch a little bit on natural materials as well and while we'd absolutely not consider um using natural materials as rewilding um, on the next slide, we really can show um, how important it is, it is to consider how we can build up a natural palette of materials that allows for that greater connection um, with nature, nature on that kind of micro scale. Again, if it's a, a tactile, it's touching, um, you know, uh, wood, timber um, and, and rope, etc. Um, and how we can use sustainably sourced materials. That's really, really essential to push that um, again for that wider uh, idea of using FSC approved timber. Perhaps it's locally sourced stone um, for features rather than something further away. And 
um looking at quality materials as well um and timber is a a, na a wonderful natural material and it can really try and, and enhance that natural aesthetic it's warmer to the touch it's more sustainable than steel and um there are a lot of different kind of species that have different properties rubinia timber is actually what we believe is the most kind of provides the most sort of longevity it's denser than oak it's harder to burn and it, um, it minimises the processes and use of toxins, and it's actually a lot better for the environment. Um, so, yeah, we really believe in, in using those natural materials just to enhance that, rather than that being specifically about rewilding in and of itself. So I'm just going to pass back over to Stephen to kind of summarise what our hopes are for the future of play. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thanks. We've done all right for time as well, actually, which is good. I think we're a bit conscious that we were going to be talking for too long. So that's always a benefit. So, yeah, final slide. So our hopes in future uh, for play. Um, we want to start seeing features. We want to start seeing everything we've just talked about integrated better into play spaces. So we want to see nature-based solutions like suds. We want to see um, more diverse uh, planting. Things like hedges replacing boundaries, increasing tree planting, because they look fantastic, but they also do all these benefits as well. And I think I'd already probably stole my final point when I was talking about those suds before. I think the increased investment and maintenance cost is always an issue, but at some point we need to realise that it's not a nice to have spend now. It's something that's multifunctional and too much of a benefit to ignore. Um, and we need to really uh, foster that love of uh, the natural world for children and the best way we can do that is uh, to get that engagement through play so it's um, fingers crossed as we seem to be kind of talking about these issues a lot more that there'll be the funding there to not just deliver it but also to maintain it um, and I think I think that's everything um, yeah thank you for having us thanks for joining us today and um, I think we're going to do a, a q and a I'll let Rosie take over the hosting Thanks, Stephen. That was so, so good. Um, yeah, I know I sit in a room with you most days, but I've learned so much from that. Um, really, really interesting. So many amazing examples. Um, and I think just things that people can hopefully take away. And I hope everyone's um, found it really interesting. Um, yeah, so I think if anyone's got any questions, um, there is a question section. Um, at the bottom um so head there if you want to ask any questions um i think i'll start off asking you guys um how how kind of often are you finding this topic coming up now and the designs that you're working on um and do you have any kind of examples um where you're working on projects that are really considering rewilding I would say at the moment, if I'm being honest, it's it's not coming up as much as I would like to see in, in the brief as a sort of forefront as what's the most important thing um, for this playground design. I would I would definitely say I'm kind of trying to shoehorn it in where I can um, and I'm pushing that agenda from us rather than seeing it um, so much from the top. But I think increasingly we are seeing, I definitely feel like there's been a lot more a focus on um, kind of trying to incorporate that on a, on a conceptual level kind of around the theming and the narrative of the site um and i think that that refers back to that example um which you're fa very familiar with rosie water beach um i think things like that are starting to come through a lot more and and that can really give a, a really interesting approach and allow you to weave those kind of themes in more um and give space to do that um so yeah it, it's interesting i just hope i hope it I hope it comes non-negotiable in briefs. Um, That's what I would like to say. Yeah. Um, I think, sorry to uh, jump in. Yeah. When we get planning conditions to discharge from a play point of view, it's really kit-led. And it kind of mm -hmm. says, you know, you need to do this X amount of this, X amount of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But really, you know, pushing it that up in the ante on with the local authorities, should they now be saying, you need to have mm -hmm. the hedges as boundaries, you need to have a certain amount of trees as part of our tree strategy, you need to be thinking about incorporating sensory planting as part of the play experience and almost if you've got a certain amount of uh, planting and, and sort of good quality landscape in there it would almost score highly against yeah. it kind of go in your favor as opposed to having a swing a slide a rocker do you know what i mean it's so i think hopefully in the coming months once these these policies kick in we'll probably start seeing a, a, a more proactive um 
uh, response from local authorities, maybe with the planning conditions. Definitely. And just picking up on what you said, Jen, um, someone in the chat's put that it, it is a, it's about education and information. Um, and I think telling the users the why is so important um, so they know why we've invested in these practices. Um, yeah, that's yeah, really key. Um, so another question here from George is, can we utilise river or stream banks um, for natural play without endangering safety? Are there examples of using stream banks in this way? Um, I don't know if you've come across any of those. I've, I've definitely not worked on in my time in the play industry. I've not worked, oh, having said that, I've not worked personally on that, but I did show a... Um, example um that was in the presentation which i'm happy to share with anyone who's interested um which was um a peter pan ship that was designed um which was designed right on the edge of the river and the um play actually went down through the river bank and was designed as part of that so not literally as you not encouraging the children to go into the river the stream which is perhaps what um this question means but it very much was integrated right on the edge of that um which is really really interesting to look mm. at so it's um that was a really nice one but i mean i would absolutely love to see that incorporated in uh, as long as it respected those natural processes and all the rest of it and integrated as part of um the landscape um i know for me childhood um my grandparents used to have a stream in their back garden and that is hugely evocative for me that, that play is there's nothing else like it playing in the stream as a kid i don't think and we shouldn't be fearful of that um yeah safety has to be a consideration but we also have to understand that children need to learn to have a natural respect for the environment and and i don't believe that kind of penning them off in a separate playground is the way to do that um yeah yeah i think um from my point of view there's there's a really impressive site at Europa Way, the, another site that we delivered with um, Urban and Civic and Bradley Murphy, where they put in a suds swale. Um, and we actually engineered a bridge. Um, so it was a double width, wheelchair accessible, wobbly bridge, which in itself is incredible. Um, but it interacted with that swale. It, was, it went over the water um, and connected two different play spaces. Um, so yeah, it's it's so doable, and I think what we find is it's up, it's down to the client in terms of how much risk they want to take on, um, and I think that that collaboration and consultation with with the play inspection company uh, with risk um, inspectors, it's kind of discussing the. I suppose the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then the level of risk, the client understanding that level of risk and taking that on and being comfortable with that. Um, it's just really important conversations, I suppose, you need to have um, if you want to deliver something like that. And like the example with the trees as well, it's that conversation and that um, narrative that you need to have. Um, there's lots more questions actually, so don't worry, we will take take these, um, Jen and Stephen will um, answer these for you and we'll email them over to you afterwards, um, but we have run out of time unfortunately, it's been um, an amazing conversation, so much information, um, this is recorded, so if you want to kind of refer back to it, um, there's an opportunity to do that um so don't worry if you kind of missed anything um or want to refer back um sorry my presentation's frozen there we go um yeah if you want to carry on the conversation please get in touch there's lots of different ways to get in touch um there's the work with us button at the bottom which will take you to our website um email us get in touch um we're happy to kind of help you and advise you even if there isn't any play involved um, so yeah, thank you for joining and just want to let you know there's a webinar coming up shortly on the kind of the future of play really, bringing play into the 21st century and using technology which um, our colleagues Sam and Michael will be presenting. So please join us for that and um, you can register on our Crowdcast um, account. So yeah, thank you for joining. Thank you, Jen and Stephen. That was amazing. And yeah, hopefully talk to you all shortly. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, thanks for joining, guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.